ahead and get started. Good morning and happy new year, everybody. Um, I don't know about you, but I am really optimistic for this year. My name is Jessica Johnson and I'm the regional director of the Kansas Small Business Development Center at Johnson County Community College. And we here at the Kansas SBDC have planned some amazing programming for this year. Stephanie, John, Jack, Valerie, and myself spent much of last quarter planning out the 2021 calendar year. And wow, I work with some amazing, smart, and talented people. There's just too much for me to indulge in right now um, in what we have coming up because I wanna make sure that you get what you came for. And that's the PPP updates and guidance for 2021. However, if you want to be informed of the latest small business news and your Kansas SBDC rollout, feel free to sign up for our newsletter at jccsbdc.com. For those of you who are not aware of us, the Kansas SBDC, we are a grant funded program of the US Small Business Administration and additionally funded through Kansas Department of Commerce and Johnson County Community College. We are one of eight regional centers in Kansas focusing on small businesses in Wyandotte, Johnson and Miami counties. Stephanie Willis, John Adesi and Jack Harwell round out our advisors and Valerie Reese is our program coordinator. All of them, actually all of us, we are so passionate about devoting our time and energy to working one-on-one -on -one with clients to empower them to truly take a hold of their business or perhaps even their business idea and their futures by advising them through starting, growing, and transitioning their businesses. These one-on-one -on -one sessions are at no charge to the client. And additionally, we do offer a variety of workshops and seminars at no or low cost through Johnson County Community College. You can see a full list of our class offerings at the link on your screen. So it's so wonderful that you're here uh, today and able to join us as we talk about the latest PPP updates and guidance. And just so you're aware, today's webinar will be recorded and we encourage you to submit your questions throughout the webinar or vote for questions you see submitted using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. To submit a question, simply type it in and submit. To vote on questions already submitted, you click on the thumbs up symbol next to that question. We will answer the questions with the most votes during this live session as time allows. The recording and slides will be provided to all attendees after the event. So we couldn't do this event alone and we brought in our experts from um, our local SBA Kansas City District Office to give you an update based on the latest legislation surrounding the Paycheck Protection Program. They've been a wonderful partner for us throughout all of the SBA program rollouts this past year, providing timely information and we greatly appreciate their support. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce and turn it over to Michael McCorder, the Lead Lender Relations Specialist and Sheila Forrester, Economic Development Specialist. Michael, Sheila, welcome. Floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jessica. And I want to reiterate too Jessica's statement there at the beginning for all you who are on this uh, webinar. The SBA has rolled out some massive programs here right recently. And as we all know, starting in uh, last year in April, we came out with the PPP. And a lot of this could not be done or made possible without the help of our partners. And Jessica and her team has been a great support for the Kansas City area. Uh, they're very knowledgeable. And I highly recommend people to get with them on their applications, either for the PPP or forgiveness. Uh, uh, I will start off the program with telling you, you don't need to pay two or three thousand dollars or five hundred dollars to somebody to fill this out. Uh, this this program was meant to help you as a small business owner and we want to get the money to you. And that's what it is, not to pay people to help you get it. Jessica and her team will help you and assist you at no cost and we'll guide you through the process if you need to. And so will our local bankers. With all that being said, I'm gonna start sharing my window to start the program. And we're gonna pull it up here. And I hope everybody can see this. It's the Paycheck Protection Program relaunch, we call it, or round two as some people refer to it. And you'll hear me in the presentation refer to this as the triple P. Uh, so as we go through the program right, and you hear me say- in your slide. Not seeing my slide. Okay, hold on. Is you seeing it now? Not yet. Not yet. Maybe I didn't push the right button. Sorry about that, guys. Here we go. Try again. There we go. Yeah, I'm getting there. Is that it? Right. Yep. 
Okay. Got a little stop thing there too. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. It's been an early morning. It's been a blizzard and snow and it's been an early day. It is Friday. Happy Friday, everybody. Uh, I thought about putting Bean Crosby music on when I woke up this morning. So <laughs> anyway, again, I want to go over this again with you. I'm sorry. The Paycheck Protection Program, uh, that's what we refer to as the Triple P or PPP program. And we're calling this the relaunch uh, of the program. Some people are calling it round two, stuff like that. But as I go through the presentation, you hear me refer to Triple P, uh, CARES Act and all that. That's just the, the shortness we use. And, uh, and like Jessica said, they're going to provide you with a copy of the PowerPoint. Now, we're going to go through here. And as I get to the next one, here's what the agenda is going to be. Uh, where we are, key updates, first draw, uh, second draw, forgiveness updates, and what to do and additional resources. So as we come in here, Congress intended for the, this round of the PPP to increase access to COVID relief funds for the hardest hit small business and those in underserved segments, including women, minority, and veterans. In response, the SBA has initially opened the PPP application to submit for community financial services, and that's that's usually we call them CFIs. Uh, also, our our uh, uh, alt cap, which is a micro lender, have been able to do this. And what this did is we opened the program, and they've been submitting loans up to today. And today, a uh, little bit bigger banks or banks can start submitting. Small banks can start submitting, and the whole program will open up. And it's probably in the PowerPoint. Uh, Tuesday after our holiday. We do have a holiday coming up and uh, Monday. Now, one thing is the lender match uh, platform. These platforms and everything that you see here is a very simple. It's not real complex. It's called SBA.gov. You just start there. You don't have to have any backslash or anything. You can work your way through anything we got. We've made it very user friendly. And lender match platform is so that borrowers, if you're out there and you're, you're thinking, well, you know, I bank with uh, the credit union, the, the fireman's credit union, and they're not doing the PP program. What do I do? You can actually go to SBA.gov and look at Lender Match, and it'll tell you about the lenders in your area that are participating in Lender Match. It's a good resource if you need to find something. Again, reach out to Jessica and her team. Uh, they'll be able to point you in the way, too, depending on the area you're in. Uh, this is continuing. We're going to continue to provide training and materials to assist you through the SBA, and we're called the field office here in Kansas City. We're the district office here. And so we'll be providing materials and training continuously. And through programs like today, teaming up with our partners, the SBDC, and the real quick, the Kansas City district office is unique in the nation because we cross, we're in Kansas and we're in Missouri. And well, Mike, how much do you have? Well, we got half of Missouri from Columbia or Columbus all the way over to the west border of Missouri. And then I've got a third of Kansas from about uh, Topeka on this way to the east is the territory that we cover. But we work with our partners and do events like this. Paycheck Protection Program keys for 2021 dates. Here again, we was talking about it. They opened it up first for the CFIs to draw on. The third team was opened up for the second draw. So they had the first people that had never applied for a loan could start applying in 11th, January 11th. The 13th, they opened it up for people applying for their second one. The 15th, today, they opened it up for banks or institutions with a billion dollars or less in assets. And then the 19th, it opens up for the first and second draw applications for all participating lending institutions. So that's, that's the big thing. I do want to point out this March 31st down here at the bottom of the slide. That is when the uh, PPP applications must be submitted by. Uh, people have asked how much money we got. What do we got? Uh, Congress set aside $288 billion in this uh, package they put together. And I believe there was also close to $132 billion left over from our last time that we did the PPP. I don't think the money is going to be a problem this time. So, and that's my personal opinion. There's nothing official about that because as everybody knows it's been through this program. We have to wait for Congress to enact this because it's all law based. And that's sometimes a little slow process there. What is the first draw PPP loans? Well, these are for eligible applicants that did not receive a PPP loan prior to August 9th, 2020. 
So if you were sitting out there thinking, well, I don't really need a loan, I don't, and now here we are, because when this thing started in March, if some of you think back, the country was going to close down for a couple of weeks, get ahead of the curve, and we're going to be done. And here we are in January, and they're talking about May and stuff around here locally before they start opening up some stuff. So you may need a loan. You never got a PPP loan, so you're going to be considered in the first draw. PPP loan eligibility now includes additional type of entities. Uh, we got the 501c6 is one pops to my mind, and that, that help uh, uh, entities like Chamber of Commerce and stuff like that. We also have ex uh, extended or expanded the uh, coverage for eligible expenses. The bars can now select a cover period anytime between eight weeks and 24 weeks. And real quick, because I always get a lot of questions about this right here. On the eight weeks to 24 weeks, that's the amount of time you believe you're going to need to uh, de deplete your funds. Your funds are based on a, a four week or a month of wages. And no matter if you pick 24 weeks, you're still only going to be eligible for the two months, and we'll get into the calculations, but two months of wages. So it, that doesn't affect if you get more or less. Uh, the first draw had a limit of 10 million. The second draw is going to have a limit of 2 million. So the application, again, that's the reason I have this highlighted or bold here. March 31st is going to be the deadline or until Congress appropriates uh, appropriation expires. So in other words, if we run out of money, then that's the end of it. Congress has to put more money in our, our bank, pardon it, but they have to dedicate more money to the Treasury Department for us to spend. So who's now eligible? Housing cooperatives, uh, destination marketing organizations, the 501c6, like I was talking about, that's pretty much like Chamber of Commerce, and eligible news organizations. This would be like your small town media, something like that. Uh, we're not talking about ABC or NBC or something like that. Still eligible are, are businesses or partnership corporations, LLC. It's the same as the first time around. The 501c3 nonprofits, the 19s, the veteran organization, and tribal business. So we're, get, we're cutting a wide swath through there. Now, the first round also, you've heard in the news about the 300 employee limit on this, this second round. And that's correct, but on the first round, there is no, it's 500, and they got to meet the small business concern. So it's a little different uh, deal on that. On the second draw of the PPP loan, as we're talking about, right here it is, bars that previously received PPP loans. So you had to get a loan first to be qualified for the second one. That's the reason they're opening it up for people to get the first. To receive the second one, you had to receive the PPP loan before August of last year have 300 employees or less, and suffered a 25% reduction in gross receipts. For most bars, the maximum loan amount on the second draw is two and a half times the average monthly 2019 or 2020 payroll cost, up to $2 million. So on the first draw, you're basing it off of 2019. On this one, you can either do 219 or 220. So you can do either year on the second draw. On the first one is 2019. Also for the uh, food industry and accommodation industry, that they are allowing them to go three and a half times the average monthly salary uh, wages, uh, either on 2019 or 2020, payroll cost up to 2 million. They're still limited to 2 million, but they'll be able to get a little more money. And I think we can all agree, and some of you owners out there that's in this call, you know, the food service sector, uh, restaurants, stuff like that has been devastated. So we're trying to get them a little more money this time. The second PPP loan application, again, must be submitted on a 2483SD. SD stands for second draw. That's our standard form when they're applied to the lenders. Again, if you need help with this form, we did include instructions on it. But again, reach out to Jessica and her team for assistance in filling out or completing the application or if you have questions. And, and right here, guys, I understand that sometimes I fill out an application, I take it to the bank. I'm not real sure if they're looking in my best interest. Trust me, they are because they want you to get this loan forgiven. They don't want you to get a loan and stay there. They want you to get it forgiven. But Jessica and her team would be like a neutral party that could look at it for you. So you have options available to help you. 
the second draw of the PPP loan eligibility. All right, additional eligibility criteria. Has used or will use the full first draw of PPP loan amount only for eligible expenses before the PPP second draw loan is dispersed. This seems to be causing a little bit of confusion in the community. You, you have to have used all your money. Now, you don't have to have it forgiven. You have to have used it all. That's, that's our guidelines. So if you got your first draw back in, the, let's say, uh, the last part of July, early part of August, you may still have funds available that you're spending. Until those funds are expended, you cannot, you cannot get a disbursement for your second draw of the PPP. And remember, some people are applying for the first time altogether. So they're going to apply for a loan today. They're not going to have it dispersed or, or depleted tomorrow. So they're going to be a little time in there. Again, I want to reiterate the fact of the 300 employees. You have to be smaller than 300 employees. So, and this is all your employees totaled up. Can uh, demonstrate at least a 25% reduction in receipts comparable quarters from 2019 and 2020. Uh, people have been a little confused on this. A quarter is January, February, March. It's calendar quarters. If I'm going to use my January, February, March of 2019, it has to be uh, 2020, January, February, March has to be 25% or less. It has to be comparable to the same quarter. I can't go in there and take February, March, and April and go, oh, there's three months, that's a quarter. It's got to be the quarters, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. And so that's that. The PPP loan forgiveness bars must apply for forgiveness through their lender. Again, I want to, I, I, if there's lenders out here, thank y'all very much. It's on this call. SBA could not have got this program up and rolling. And, and after we go through this 288, we're close to a trillion dollars that we're going through of loans. And I believe the first round, they did almost six and a half million loans. The SBA could not have done this without our partners in the lending community. And the lenders are the ones that are lending their money until you get it forgiven and then they get their money back. So it's a partnership there and we're really thankful for that. Now, a couple of updates that they did on this, the idle advance, some people understand this, some people call it advance grant. Back when the idle was first came out, President Trump made a national declaration, presidential declaration of disaster for the whole nation in all territories. When he did that, that enacted SBA disaster uh, some of you may, I think it's Greensboro up there in Kansas where the tornado went through the F5 and wiped out the town. I worked that disaster when I was in that disaster division. Once that's enacted, we go out and start making loans. Then Congress voted the CARES Act that started the PPP. Well, when we got down to forgiveness, some, because of the law, the way it was written in the CARES Act, we had to deduct the advances. And the advances were from one to $10,000. With the new law, they no longer deduct that. And if you got forgiven and had that deducted from your PPP part, you will be getting that money back. Will it be tomorrow? No, it's gonna take a little while, but it's all gonna be system generated. You don't have to do anything. We're gonna do that for you. And then we're gonna send it to your lender. If you've already paid it off, the lender will give you the money. If you're set up on payments, they'll tell you the loan's paid in full and refund any money you've paid. So going forward, we don't deduct it. And we're also gonna go back to the beginning and we're gonna give everybody the money that we've deducted from them. Uh, the PPP uh, forgiven loan, there, there are not gonna be taxable income on that. This law has addressed that because I know there were some concerns with CPAs and stuff out there on the last PP, the first round, that the expenses paid on PP funds are you know are now tax deductible before they were not going to be tax deductible because you have the government paying your expenses how can you deduct it from your taxes so i would strongly suggest you consult with the irs for details on this we are not the irs department i'm not a tax official i'm not a tax representative I'm not a tax attorney i'm just letting you know that the new law has supposedly taken care of all the taxable income on the ppp associated with it whether you got one in april of 19 or you get one today so I would check with that. Expanded the forgivable expense uh, of the PPP loans. Uh, it's already forgiven. So we're going to be we're going to be looking at that, that as uh, like expenses like, hey, Mike, I had to put up the plastic shields 
at the front desk or at the front counter where people come into the store to keep, you know, help for from it. You're going to have you're going to have the ability to deduct those expenses. And so coming soon, a simplified forgiveness application of 150 and under. It hasn't come out yet. It's coming. But as soon as it's out, then you'll be able to use that form, too. We're trying to make it streamlined as best as possible. Uh, what to do with additional resource uh, additional resources? What can you do? OK, uh, we have again, I'm going to talk about the lenders match real quick. Contact lenders in the Kansas City District office, which again is a third of Kansas and half Missouri. We have about 600 lenders, bankers who are signed up to do PPP. So pretty much you can throw a rock around any bank corner and you, you can hit a bank that does them. It's not a, it's not like some areas. And I know there's some problems in some of the outlying areas of banks, but here in Kansas district up in all the way up to Kirksville, all the way down to uh, Houston over in Missouri and from uh, Topeka up to uh, Fort Leavenworth and down there to Pittsburgh, down the very South of Kansas. Most all of the towns have lenders doing it, but if you can't find one, do go to lendermatch.gov. The sba.gov backslash PPP, that just takes you right into the updates. But like I said before, you can go to sba.gov and you can get there. It's not real hard. And that'll give all the updates. As this thing is, when we when we did the marching one, guys, when we did that, it was like build an airplane, but they took off in it. And we were scrambling, trying to put together. Now we have the airplane flying. It's like we're adding engines. And as uh, Jessica and her team can test, things are changing. And it's uh, sometimes it's daily, uh, hourly. Sometimes it's every other day. But definitely things are changing as we get into it. And we understand that there's a problem here or there. We change or give guidance to how to address those situations. Uh, contact your district office, I believe, today. And plus with the emails, when you received your PowerPoint, they'll have emails for the uh, Sheila and myself and you'll be able to contact us directly if you need to. Uh, I will tell you that, that, that Jessica and her team probably be a faster response on a lot of questions because uh, myself and, and Sheila, we're working with bankers, we're working with small business owners, we're working with local governments, we're working with our partners. So to say we're in, inundated with a lot of requests for information would be an understatement. But uh, you know, we'll be glad to help you any way we can. So don't feel, you know, go ahead and reach out to us. But email is the best way to get a hold of us. Uh, you can subscribe to the SBA newsletter and get updates on that. And also, Sheila does a real great job on the Twitter account uh, at SBA. You can follow her some stuff like that. I know this has questions right here, but I want to take just a brief moment and give you a little background for some of you that are new or haven't been to the PPP loan program or haven't received one or anything like that. When Congress enacted the CARES Act and started the PPP loan, the triple P, uh, that, that was set up through the Treasury. The Treasury then looked around and said, we need the SBA to facilitate getting the money to the small business owners. SBA looked around and said, we're going to use our dedicated uh, lenders to, to facilitate the loans to the small businesses. And then we'll pay them back as we come along. So I want to tell you that because when we get updates or when things change, you actually have a unique situation. We have two government agencies. And just because we're government agencies and brothers and sisters and all that, we play in our own sandbox and they play in theirs. So we're having to be really outside the sandbox helping each other. And sometimes Treasury comes up with an idea and wants to implement something. They have to run it by SBA to make sure it's okay. Same thing, SBA has to run it by Treasury. My point is, there's a lot of moving parts to this, and we have to take our time and make sure that we're presenting the program and getting the product out there in accordance to law. And I, I know I've said that several times, but this is a law based because when they say a bill and Congress passes it, president signs it, it's a bill, so it's a law. And we try to work within the frameworks of what they give us. And with that, I know it's about 1025. It's been a pretty quick little go through. But I found that here recently, the questions help a lot of people. Please don't think, oh, I, I don't need to ask that question because there's probably three or four other people thinking about it too. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jessica and stop sharing my screen. Hopefully. Okay. Jessica? Looking good. All right. So we have um, first question here. 
uh, Michael, will lenders use the same lender portal as before to submit applications for our borrowers? We do not seem to have access today. Please advise. If your lender's got over a billion dollars in assets, or maybe you're right at a billion, that portal is not open yet for you, but it's the forgiveness portal. Uh, they should know what I'm talking about on that because they've done it. it Everything's going to be set up in that portal, so you'll be able to check the loans, uh, input the loans, forgive loan, all in one location. Uh, that's the portal we're going to use. And also, if they're lenders, shoot us an email, but there's some definite uh, email addresses that have changed a little bit to help lenders. Um, I Like in the first round, Jessica, as you and I talked back in March last year and April, uh, the system was set up by a contractor and they put it into our system, but they did not allow us access at the district level. So I can't go in and look at a loan that Jessica puts in and she's a lender. I can't go look at it physically, look at it and see what's going on. And that hinders a little bit, but we did come out with a lot of new uh, emails and phone numbers for lenders to contact. Great, thank you. All right, next question we have regarding the idle advance provided last year for the first round, since mine was deducted from my PPP amount, I paid it back. Just so I'm clear, you stated that we will get these idle advance amounts back from our SBA lender or bank, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, you will. And, and I want to reiterate, guys, be a little patient because what we're doing is just a little inside baseball for you. They're actually coming up with a program. Everything has to be program written these days. We're living the day of the world. They're writing a program or in the process or have done it by now. But anyway, the program is going to go through and say, okay, Jessica got deducted $2,000 for advance in her loan data system. And that computer can go in and go, okay, we need to refund her bank that $2,000 plus interest and send it to them. Then Jessica went down to the bank, paid it off when she found it. The bank will then turn and hand Jessica that money. So they, the banker will notify you once they receive it. There's nothing Jessica has to do to uh, start the process or get the money. It's all going to be done within our program. And that way we'll be able to get the money out better. And, and we don't need, and, and, and I understand you want your money, you need your money and all that. But if you send emails asking where's my money and all that, you're just going to type other questions that people could have spent time on. This program is going to be done internally and the money will be sent to your lender and by law, they have to contact you. So if you're dealing with a lender, uh, say Jessica's dealing with a, a McCorder Bank and Trust out of Texas, what did their loan? She's not real sure. They, they may not tell her, you know, I got to, I want to know. The bankers have to by law. The FDIC is not going to let them take money in and hold it and keep it. They have to disperse the funds. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to work through it. The lenders are going to get you your money, but it'll be a process. It's going to be a little patient. I, I anticipate probably 60, 90 days, Jessica, before you start seeing people get money on that. Great. Thank you. Okay. Next question. Can you provide clarification for those businesses who might have expanded by opening an additional location or hired more employees towards the end of the 12 month period, thus increasing payroll costs? If that new payroll was only in effect for the last three months, the 12 month average could be significantly lower. Is there flexibility that would allow the borrower to base the loan amount on the current payroll cost in this situation? The second draw, the first draw has got to be based on 2019. We're opening up the first draw like they went ahead and got a loan in the April through August period. So, August, I, you know, from uh, April 3rd through August 8th, they may not have had those expanded employees, but everything, everybody got a loan had to go on 2019. So the same rules apply to them on the first draw. On the second draw, and I may be going a little over, but 2019 or 2020, you can use either one for your wages. So you can use the wages currently for 2020. Uh, well, I know it's 2021, I understand, but 2020, last year, the last three months you increased. So, all right. So you can use that for your wages if it's on the second draw. Great. Okay, next question. What is acceptable documentation for the reduction in gross revenues? 
check with your lenders. They're going to be the most update, but currently setting here, if you have, uh, if you're sitting there and you have a business operating, you could use your quarterly sales returns. If you collect sales tax, uh, you could use your uh, quarterly returns filed. Uh, most business has to file quarterly taxes. So you could use that compared to 2019. And if you're a sole prop, you're basically didn't file quarterly. You're by yourself. You don't file, you know, if you don't fit in any one of those categories, you don't file, uh, you don't have a business where you have to pay sales tax to the state because you collected them, then you could look at your annuals. I could go ahead and do a PL, a current PL statement, which is a profit and loss statement year end. So January through December 31st, I could do that, have accounting done and compare that to 2019 taxes. Those will be acceptable. Now, you probably want to fill out, and I believe part of the guidance in there, you have to fill out your Schedule C, even though you haven't filed it with the IRS, you will need to complete that for your lender to look at. So there's a little flexibility in there, but not much, but we're looking at quarter to quarter, and the documentation's got to be something. It, it can't be like QuickBooks, Jessica. You know what I'm saying? It's got to be some kind of document that you can, I got, I filed my taxes here for the quarterly to the IRS. Here's my 2019 second quarter. Here's my 220 second quarter. See, I, I went from 100,000 in sales to 75,000. So I got my 25% reduction. It does not matter. I won't point this out too, because it's something else coming up. If I have a 25% reduction in any quarter, one, two, three, or four, either quarter compared to 19, I qualify even though my business may have made 11% profit over annual. So if you're a quarterly filer and you, you hit that in one of the quarters, you're good to go. Even though your business may have picked up, you may have done more business and had a profit or increase of your sales over 2019 on your annuals. If you're an individual and that happens, you're not going to meet the quarter part because it's got to be a quarter loss in uh, revenues from the year end to year end. All right. And I think you just answered the next question, but I'm going to read it so it, it gets heard. Um, does there have to be a 25% reduction each quarter to be eligible for the second draw? If there is, or in other words, if there is a reduction in one quarter, but not the others, is the company eligible? Yes, it, it's one quarter. We're good to go. You could, you could have had a 500% increase and I'm being over exaggerating, but going up the third quarter, but the second quarter you went down. So that's all it's required. Great, great. All right, next question. We've spent all funds um, from our PPP round one loan on allowable expenses. However, a small amount of those expenses were incurred and paid outside of the 24 week cover period. Does that in any way create an issue for applying for round two? Shouldn't. That's real technical because then you'd have to look at the financials. Was it in the forgiveness part that goes down another stream, but if the Debt was incurred during the 24 week period, but a good example, your utility bill at home, Jessica. Uh, I just got mine the other day. Good God. I mean, it's, it's terrible, these electric bills now. I like a warm house. Uh, I, I had that debt was for December, but I'm paying it in January. So since I incurred the debt, if that had been my 24 week period would have been in December, now it's over, but I'm not paying it till January. 18. That is an eligible expense back to the covered period because it's, you know, it's paid in arrears. So that's a real little bit technical, but I hope that helps a little bit if you paid it. Yes, if you have, if you've expended your money, again, Jessica, I think this is a good time to reiterate one thing. This program was designed to help pay wages. They wanted, and it started out at 75%. They reduced it down to 60 to help. The whole intent is to pay wages of your employees or yourself if you're self-employed. If you spend the money all on yourself or all on your employees, great, that's what we want. You do not have to spend this money on expenses. Some people think I got to spend 40% in expenses because I only got 60% for wages. No, if you spend 99% for wages and 1% for expenses, you're good. We want you to spend it on wages. So it, you don't have to tie yourself in that box that I got to spend 40% on expenses. You don't have to do that. Great. Great. All right. 
On the application, um, the number of employees, if you have three employees and one um, is W-2 and the other is a 1099, so an independent contractor, not really an employee, can you count the 1099 independent contractors? The banker is asking for 941 forms and is only showing the one employee, but there are three. Uh, you hit it right there. The In that scenario, uh, when they say three employees, I'm going to go that one is them, second one's a W-2, and the third one's a 1099 for our exercise. The Therefore, you only have two employees, not three. You have two, but yourself and the W-2 employee. When you handle the 1099, that's what it's going to be. They should not be counting the independent contractor in your wages. You shouldn't be counting. They shouldn't be counting it. Uh, but that's that's what it is because you can't get money because the 1099, as you well know, Jessica, can go out and file for a PPP and then they can have their own PPP. So 1099 is not one of your employees that you should get credit for wages. Uh, as a matter of fact, when you fill out the application, it should list two employees. And also, Jessica, that we had just the other day, I know I didn't get in the PowerPoint, but to let your team know, before when they filled out the application as a solo prop, they didn't put any employees in there. This time we're requiring at least, that there can't be zero employees anymore. It has to be one. So I know last time we filled out and they're like, I'm not an employee, I'm the owner, I'm self-employed. I'm Okay, you're still got to count just one. So on the new applications on that 2348 SD, you got to have at least one employee to be eligible. Okay, yeah, thanks for that info. All right, next question, and it's on the idle advance. Um, so I received an idle advance of $1,000 out of the 10000 possible. I read that you can apply for the rest of the grant, meaning I could apply for the additional 9000 Is this accurate information? No, it's not. <laughs> Good news, though. No, they're, they're going to go back, and, I, and I, that's the reason I don't mention in any of my presentation, but I'll answer the question. Working with the ODA as many years as I did. And when I say ODA, guys, I'm sorry. Office of Disaster Assistance, that's SBA, that's the thing in Fort Worth, Texas, the big center and all that. What they're going to do is go back, and there is in the law that they go back and go up to 10000 which they say that that's what Congress intent was, is to give everybody $10,000 in the idle program, but they said later, as you read down through it, the attorney said, no, it's $1,000 per every employee, and that's the way it went out the door, because that's the way the law was written. We can't even though the, the Congress wanted to do this, when they lied, when they signed that bill and everything, it's what was in there that's legally binding. So now with the new one, they've took that language and, and overrode or deleted it or canceled it out with new language saying that the CARES Act number 630, 11, 12 is no longer significant, blah, blah, blah. So you're going to get your pre fund of the idle advance for anybody who filled out a economic disaster loan, the idle loan application before December 27, 2020. If they received idle advance or they didn't, they're going to get the funds sent to them. This is like the deduction that was in the PPP. There's nothing to do. We're going to send it. This, and this is the reason I'm talking about this, you do not have to apply for anything. Again, the program's going to go through and go, oh, Jessica got a thousand dollars. Example, the program's going to tag that, and it's going to send her nine thousand more dollars to her bank account. And a lot of you got that advance. No, it just you woke up one day and it's like, it's like winning the lottery. You had some money in your bank account. Woo let's go. You know, so uh, <clears throat> it'll be there. They're going to email you and let you know they're sending. It. Of course, they will notify you, but it will show up in your bank account more than likely before you get the email because, again, there's twelve and a half million of those applications, and so Congress has dedicated enough money to pay everybody ten thousand dollars that applied after that there's talk about extending but that's just out there in the breeze they got to do a law for it so the office of disaster assistance will be coming out with guidelines on it but i do know inside baseball you don't have to do anything or contact anybody it'll be done internally through a program okay good information all right next question what if i have contractors that are basically like employees and work every week for me. Can I use them for payroll or only employees? I'm not quite sure what this question is asking. Uh, let's go with, 
Yes, you have employees, but let's say you pay them. At the end of the year, you give them a 1099. They may show up every day and work on your job. They may be, uh, you know, uh, basically self-employed people themselves, but they show up at your job and work and you pay them. I pay them. I pay the guys $20 an hour. They show up every day, Monday through Friday. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> COVID. Oh, uh, so you, you've got those people that show up, but they're not employees. Now, employee is defined, and I'm not part of the labor department, but you can go to the labor department. And Jessica, you probably dealt more with this. It's FTEs, full-time employees. And there's actually an eligibility box that they fit in that determines that if they're full-time employees or not, and that's the employee count they're asking for. So you have to beat that. So if you don't 10, if you don't 941 and Jessica's at 943 is the other document that they can do when you file annually on your employees, I believe. I get IRS numbers all mixed up. So, so many. Yeah. So you got a 941 and 943 that you file when you have employees that you withhold their payroll tax and also collect it and send it to Uncle Sam. If you're not doing that for them, they're not employees for this program okay. i think that it, it, maybe that's wrong but uh, that's what i'm thinking about the question sounds good um next question we had five employees at the first application and eight now half full-time and half part-time so our payroll expenses are higher now do we have to use the whole year's average for the calculation or can you use a quarter how do we best capture our current salary for the basis of the loan amount? I'm going to go with a quarter uh, in something like that. Uh, again, and again, it's going to be on the application. It's going to be with you and the lender and lenders going to have some good guidance on that too, but a quarter should suffice in 2020. Uh, and we know that a lot of people are going to get more money than what they got the first time because of some of the flexibilities built into the program. Again, back to my restaurants. Restaurants last time can only get two and a half. Now they can get three and a half. So you may got you may have received Jessica ten thousand dollars on the first PP. Now they look at your application and all your finances and like this question here. Now you're going to get fifteen thousand. That's great. There's there's not any limits. You don't have to stay with what you got the first time. That's great news. Great. Yeah. Um, next question. Is the application process the same across each, each lender? Yes. Now, now, some of your lenders are using APIs, which is an automated uh, processing system where you go online and you go to Mike McCorder Bank and Trust. And I actually have the application where you can fill it out online. It's a digital application. Uh, it's going to have the same information that's on our paper application, but it won't be our paper application because it's a program that they download all the information through. But yes, by and large, they all use the same. It has to require the same information. Okay, great. Um, for sole proprietors, what documentation is needed? Depends on what they're doing, but uh, we'll go with they're trying to apply for a loan. If they're trying to apply for one and they, uh, let's go number one, they applied for it last time and got it. This time they're gonna, that the thing I would do is, is I'd have my filed uh, 2019 because you should have filed by now, your schedule C. Uh, and then what I would do is look at the end of year, my financial statement, I'd fill out my schedule C for 2020. And I'd take the two documents and put them together and see if I've got a 25% reduction in sales or gross revenues. And if I don't, I'm not eligible. If I do, I'm eligible to move forward and go down and get your uh, loan. If it's your first loan, you didn't do a second, you got to go off your 2019. So just get your tax return, your 1040 with your Schedule C, walk down, and that's going to be the basis of your numbers. Bring it to like your team, like, uh, you know, Jack and y'all, you know, you can sit there and go over and show them where the numbers go. Because it's, again, I'm sorry, I'm not IRS guy, but. Somewhere down there, it's got net revenue, gross revenues, and you got to calculate all that and put it all in there. So uh, that's where you get the information. That's the documents you need. For forgiveness, basically on a sole prop, you need probably uh, your 19 tax return again. If, if the lender lost it or so, I don't know. You, they should have that. But uh, you're going to need probably a bank statement showing that the money went in. I've got a business account called uh, Mike's Genius World. And I got my PPP loan, my money went in there. And then I took that account and I wrote myself a check 
to Mike McCorder and and I put it in my personal account. All I need to do is see the cancel check and the bank statement. That should be suffice for uh, forgiveness because you just got to you can't leave the money in your business account. It has to go to you because that's what the money is intended for is to help you because you're a sole prop. We're trying to get you money to pay your bills, live on and stuff like that during the shutdown. Great. Um, this next um, question, um, more of a statement, I think, but um, first draw PPP applied for, so applied for the first draw, and now can't pick between 2019 and 2020. Can't pick. Now you can pick on the second draw. You should be able to pick. Now the can't pick is the reduction. You got to show the reduction between 19 and 20 of the 25%. But I believe the wages, as it reads in the IFR, you can go, well, look at my quarter here, my 941 file. And we're going to say a business that has employees, 10 employees. I can look at my 941 for the end of the year and go, this is my wages for the end of the year for 20, the last quarter. That's my employees. I got, example, 10 employees. When I applied for the first one, we had eight. We used 2019 last quarter. Here's myself. So I don't understand the thing, but you can use 2020 or 2019 only on the second draw. On the first draw, even though we're here in January 21, it has to go back to 19. Okay, thanks for that. Yeah, that's good clarification. All right, next question. Um, which we've already answered this. If our idle advance was deducted from PPP forgiveness on the first draw and we already paid it back, will it be returned now? Yes. The bank will take care of that and contact you directly. All right, next question. If our company um, received their loan through QuickBooks, how do I find the loan information that lists the loan ID, et cetera? I'm trying to help a very small sole proprietor through the forgiveness process and possible second. Um, yeah, and thanks for helping them too. Appreciate any help you give anybody uh, to do it. Uh, it if you have an individual that got a first round PPP and they're trying to fill out the application for the forgiveness, they may or may not have the loan number. I know all that's at the top of the application page. I'm strictly going off mine. And as we know, I'm getting older. My mind didn't quite what it used to be. You can get the SBA loan number from the lender. All you do is just either call them, uh, send them an email, walk in the door, and they will give you their application number and their SBA loan number. Now, as far as the idle loan or idle advance you had to put in there, we really don't need that anymore because we're not deducting it. And if they hadn't filled out the application yet, they can just leave that blank because the application hadn't changed yet, but we know we don't need it. And that's like, Jessica's right after the name, then I think it's the SBA PPP loan number, the bank loan number, the amount, uh, and then idle come in. And you don't need that idle information. So the easy answer there is, Pick up the phone, call your lender, get the information, go by there, uh, you know, send them an email, you know, hey, what are, however you communicate with your banker, do that. And then the banker is more than happy to provide you that information again. And for all those out there that aren't bankers listening, guys, this is their money they lent to you. And it wasn't the federal government. It wasn't Treasury. It wasn't Trump. It wasn't nobody until the loan gets forgiven. That's when we at the SBA and the Treasury give the bank back the money. So uh, they want you to get that money forgiven so they can get the money and, and loan it to other individuals needing it. Uh, you know, this it's, it's not, it's not, it's not advantageous for them to hold Jessica for a five year note at 1% interest. That's everybody knows that's not the money out there on the street today. And you can't get loans like that. They want you to get forgiven. You don't need the debt. We're in a pandemic. You don't need any more debt for your business. And they want to get you forgiven as well. So uh, contact Lender, you get some numbers. Great, great. Next question. If I have a new business in 2020 that did not apply for first round of PPP, can I apply now as a new applicant? Because taxes have not been filed, what would be provided to apply? That one is a good one. We get tons of those each day here in the district office and Sheila gets them. Uh, Jessica, unfortunately, right now, there's nothing they can do because they don't fit the parameters of being in business before February 15th, 2020, in order to be eligible for first round. Yeah. Now, there's nothing about the second round yet, but the only criteria on the second round, the way the law was written is you had to get a 
PPP the first time. I know this is going to be an issue and they're probably going to come out with some kind of amendment to the law or something like that because a lot of people started business in, you know, May, June, or maybe, and the other thing might help some people out there too, listen and ask question. If I bought Jessica's business in, in June of 2020 and Jessica got a first round PPP, am I eligible? There's no guidance yet because now everything's under my social security number and I didn't apply the first time. So now how are we going to get the system to talk and know that that happened? Those are things that we're waiting on guidance that will be coming forth. Uh, but the law was written. We had to get this program out in 10 days like uh, last time. And that's what we worked on the majority of. So there is a few things like it, Jessica, that we know there's some issue or, or we need to figure out something to do because some people did start a business because our, here's a good example real quick. And I know we're running out of time. Uh, I'm, I'm going to put in a, uh, uh, a game place for, you know, it's got putt putt golf. It's got, uh, uh, video games, laser tag. It's just a kid place. And I started that project building it in 2019 in December and January. We start, we broke ground. We started building our building. The thing happened in March government, everything shuts down. I finally get my building finished in August of 2020, put up an open sign. I still can only put it, bring in 10 people, whatever it was. Am I eligible for a PPP? Because I started my business back then. Well, you wasn't in operation. You didn't have any sales because you was doing construction. So there's, there's things like that that we got to work through. We know that happened and by no fault of their own. And we need to figure out how to get them money. Okay, great. Thanks for that guidance. All right, next question. For a self-employed farmer with no employees, was the max loan amount calculation changed to allow gross income, max of 100,000 instead of net profit from Schedule F? Yes, that was changed. And they can apply for the max on the second. And we're still waiting for guidance on doing maybe an increase on the first if they didn't get much. Maybe they got $3,000. And let's say they qualify for the max, or say they qualify for 15,000. Uh, we're still working on that as well. They can go back from the first one and get 12,000 more in a loan. The thing is, if they go back and get the uh, increase, then they have to wait till they spend it before they apply for the second. So that's still out there and works. We're still waiting to get a little bit further. But yes, they, that is one of the big things that changed on the Schedule F. All right, great. Um, next question. I'm a sole proprietor and use some of my retirement funds to pay for expenses. Would that be refundable? Mm, that's going to be a case by case basis. I don't think, I don't think I'd worry about that. If you're a sole proprietor, you're working off of net revenues anyway, and we're replacing your net revenues, not your expenses. Uh, you shouldn't be worried about what you spend the money for expenses because that money's all yours. Uh, that's to give you money to live on. So uh, I'm just saying off the top of my head, it shouldn't be an issue because and I mean the expenses, it doesn't matter if you borrowed money from your 401k to pay your expenses, uh, because you should just be paying yourself back the net revenues uh, and that your money. So you really shouldn't have to worry about that. Uh, if that is the case, if you got a receipt, your money's commingled. Your money, if your sole priority is commingled. If I, if I go in the kitchen and take the money out of the cookie jar and pay my cell phone bill and I get my PPP money, and you know it's just a little bit and it covered that period so you got to be in that cover period uh, it's commingled I, I just don't see it being an issue it, it, maybe they need to reach out to us in an email and for additional information i know i can't i can't come up with what scenario that becomes an issue if they paid for it if they paid for expenses back in december and they get the second round today they can't count that expense on their expenses today that's the only thing i can come up with jessica okay Okay, that's good. So looking at the time, I think we have time for maybe two more questions, Michael. Um, so we have a uh, up first for first time loan on schedule F for farmers. Do we now use gross revenue versus the net income? Yes, if you're a first time, 
because the law overrides the first, you'll be able to use the gross instead of the net. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> which, which, whichever. <laughs> <laughs> Um, next question. If a company is applying for a first round PPP loan now, do they have to use 2019 payroll cost or can they use 2020 if that would provide them a higher loan amount? 2019. Because everything on the first round was based on the first CARES Act. The second round doesn't change the requirements for that. Okay. And you answered both of those so quickly, Michael. I'm going to give I you know. one bonus. Give me one more. One more bonus question. Uh, the bonus round. I'm going, Jimmy, I'm going for it. Bonus round. <laughs> I'll take behind door number three. Yeah. Okay, here we go. With regard to service industry, we are a small brewery, and our NAICS code for that category, since we do manufacture beer, all of our revenue comes from our internal bar. So we should be eligible for the three, three and a half times amount. Is that something we can change or otherwise become available? If, if their next code starts with 72, they can. Okay. 72. If it doesn't, then no, I understand that you may be underneath the different, but all my revenues come from people coming in the door. You know, like you say, your bar, your, your bar there. Uh, if you're not under the 72 code, no. Uh, because again, there, Jessica, that's the law they put in there, 72. It has to be under the first part of the 72, which is a category of accommodations and uh, uh, restaurants and stuff. So if they're under that, they get three and a half. If not, it's two and a half. That's just based on the law. Okay. All right. Great. Well, um, I know there were more questions out there, and I'm sorry we ran out of time. We um, uh, uh, weren't able to answer everything. But as Michael said, you can email either the Casey District Office or us at the Kansas SBDC if we did not get to your specific question, and we'll get you answers um, to your questions. And with that, I do want to go ahead and show you how you can get a hold of us. Um, on your screen there, you can contact us at our email, ksbdc at jccc.edu, our phones. We are working remotely, um, but our phones are answered um, um, Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. So um, you will get a person um, answering the phone or we'll uh, get right back with you if you do leave a message. Um, so that's how you can contact us. Also, um, our website, jcccfbdc.com, we have out there um, the interim final rules for the first and second draw posted that the SBA sent out, um, as well as one pager highlights. Thank you so much to um, our advisors, Jack Harwell and John Adesi for getting those um, getting those prepared. They spent countless hours going through those interim final rules to pull out um, the meat and potatoes, what I like to call it. Um, and we had the um, um, SBA Wichita District Office review those and, and provide any feedback that they saw. So um, the, they're pretty in-depth highlights um, um, that pull out the pertinent information from those. Uh, and you can find those on our website as well to help you um, decipher those interim final rules. And with that, I want to thank Michael and Sheila so much for being here. And um, the rest of you in the audience, please have a wonderful uh, weekend. And I would be remiss if I didn't say go Chiefs this weekend. That's true. Go Chiefs. Y'all have a good one.